pastor just said to me, um, this is going to be a sad Christmas because <laughs> the message, it seems like, you know, um, whoredom. Hmm. So we, we will find out. Um, so when I was writing this, this message, um, you know, together there's lots of reading, lots of search, uh, researching and prayers. And when I finally finished it and I timed myself, it's like almost two hours. Who wants to be here for two hours? <laughs> so, and I said, all right, I'll, I'll cut it in half. And I said, okay, we'll do an hour. Is that okay, an hour? Ah. Oh. And then when my wife told me last night that the kids are going to be here. So I don't think the kids can stay with me for an hour. So <laughs> I will make a deal with you kids. <laughs> um, we're going to make this a half an hour sermon. All right. But here's the deal. Where's the kids? Where's the kids? Um, I need you to, to listen and to pay attention. Okay, I don't want to hear any whining, no complaining, all right? So remember, there, I prepared a sermon for half an hour, an hour, or two hours. So if I hear you guys making sound, or say sound, all right, so it's going to be a long sermon. <laughs> um, and the same rule applies to the parents. So if you see your parents are not paying attention, I don't know, so we're, we're going to be here for, for a long time. So... Um, again, we will continue with our Advent series, um, focusing on Jesus, our Lord. In the Old Testament, once again, the, the goal of this series, which started three weeks ago with Pastor Sonny, is to emphasize the, and preach the importance of the Old Testament in our Christian faith. Okay? So every story, including the Old Testament and the New Testament, is a pointer to Jesus Christ. Okay? So all professing Christians must know its importance and must have a good understanding of our faith and the Bible as a whole, which includes both Old Testament and the New Testament. Who can memorize all the 39 books of the Old Testament? Nobody? Nathan? Can you memorize? Can you, can you come here? Hmm? Okay, so this is my eldest son, Nathan. So he's, he's, gonna, he's going to memorize with, with us this morning all the books, 39 books of the Old Testament. So we'll see. Are you seeing more? <laughs> okay. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Wow. Wow, thank you, Nate. Thank you, Nate, and that was awesome. I couldn't even memorize that myself. <laughs> so that, that could be our challenge for the new year, okay? It's to memorize, not the old, that's the Old Testament, but the whole Bible. But, you know, it is troubling to see that some pastors today think that we can do it without the 39 books. So that's why we're doing this series. Um, a simple example would be if you read a book or just watch a movie, um, you, you can just see a part of it, right? So you can, you can come to a wrong conclusion or understanding because you are only taking part of that movie or that book, right? So I also think about like eating an orange, right? You can't just take a part of it and throw out the rest, right? You must ingest every piece to take, you know, to taste and enjoy that whole orange. And all the more with our Bibles, which is inspired, the word, inspired word of God, right? 
So Jesus warned, in, warned us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, that whoever or anyone adds and takes away from it will be punished. Right? Revelation chapter 22. So, Brother Eugene's sermon um, two weeks ago was a great example of why we cannot disregard the Old Testament. Because it's all connected. Right? It's all connected together. And he showed us three examples of why the Old Testament is important. Right? If you missed that sermon, you can refer to that sermon, including Pastor Sunny's sermon. Right? They are available on our church website and our Facebook. So today, we will look at the life of Prophet Hosea. It's, it's, he's very less known, right? It's, it's, he's very, um, what do you call it? Like, I don't, to me, as personally, I don't go to this. You know, I always go to the major prophet, right? So that's why we're studying this. I think, Pastor Sunny, we can do this minor prophet sermon. Oh, yeah. um, so we will look at his life and how his life story show us God's relentless love for his people. Okay? So, in the Bible, Hosea is, in, is considered as a minor prophet. Right? The minor prophet books, aside from Hosea, are, again, um, to those who are expecting or need boy names or planning to, you know, for future, consider these names. It's like what Nathan said. Joel, Amos, Amos, sorry, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, maybe you can name your son Habakkuk, Sepaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So don't be confused, okay? So although they are called minor prophets, it doesn't mean that these books are less important than the major prophets, okay? So this is not the NBA or MLB or any sort of professional um, sport, right? In that context, players are in the minor leagues because they are not good enough to play in the major leagues, okay? So not so in, in the scripture. They are called minor prophets because the messages are direct, they are shorter, and easily summarized, right? But it holds the same weight as the other books in the Bible as a whole. Okay, so again, minor prophet books are just as important as the rest of the book in the Bible because it is the word of God, right? Sadly, though, the books of the 12 minor prophets are some of the least studied by Christians today. These are great books um, because, again, it's, it's part of the Bible as a whole, and they contain some of the great themes of the scripture, including God's mercy and judgment, his covenant with Israel, the day of the Lord, and the coming of Messiah, our Messiah, our Jesus Christ, second coming. In Hebrew, Hosea is pronounced Hoshea. I don't know if I even pronounced that right. Hoshea, okay? And in English, it means salvation. I think we can already conclude our message today. Right? What other proof do we need that, um, to see that this book is pointing to our Jesus Christ? Hosea means Savior, salvation. So let's give a quick background of Hosea's story. His ministry was 30 to 40 years long. So most scholars um, said that his ministry was probably from 750 to 720 BC, before Christ. Hosea was a contemporary of prophet Isaiah and Micah, okay? So meaning they served the Lord together at the same time, okay? So prophet Isaiah and Micah ministered in the southern kingdom of Judah. And Hosea ministered primarily in the northern kingdom of Israel. So there's, I have a map here. Um, so Israel was divided into two nations, okay? About 200 years prior to Hosea's time during the reign of Solomon's son named Rehoboam. So 
see the map here. 200 years of um, adulterers living towards their God. And here enter our man, Hosea. So the foundational storyline of this book is something quite unique and surprising. It has something to do with whom God commands Hosea to marry. So again, in Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, it says, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take Third, take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Just imagine what Hosea was thinking when God told him that this is the woman I have for you, right? I have chosen for you a very popular woman. Everyone knows her in town, right? <laughs> and ta-da! Her name is Gomer, the prostitute. Man, like, I don't know how you would react. So just, just imagine the people and during the time when they found out that Hosea is marrying a prostitute, a godly, faithful servant of God marrying a prostitute. Just imagine all the marites, right? Marites is all the gossipers, right? So, you know, you would think, and God is basically saying, it's the same way I have chosen you. I have the same way I love you, but you are unfaithful to me, right? So, Gomer had a reputation before marriage, a loose woman, right? She's a prostitute. I wish I could say that Hosea changed um, the way, you know, Gomer is living her life and the way um, Hosea loved her, but she proved to be un unfaithful, very unfaithful and ad adulterer. If you read the whole chapter of uh, Hosea, you know, they, they have three children together, but still, Gomer still chooses to sleep around with other men. That's how unfaithful she is. So the Lord commands Hosea to do this because Hosea and his wife Gomer are going to be a living illustration to the people of Israel. So throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the covenant of marriage has always served to be an illustration of God's relationship with us and likewise, our relationship with him. In the Old Testament, marriage primarily serves to illustrate God's relationship with Jewish people or the nation of Israel. And in the New Testament, speaks of Jesus' relationship with the church, all his followers, including if you believe in Jesus Christ, this is... Right, so I will give you... Um, few verses as examples and we will we will look at the Old Testament and also the New Testament okay so first is Isaiah chapter 54 verse 5 says for your maker is your husband the Lord of hosts is his name Isaiah 62 verse 5 it says and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride so shall your God rejoice over you. And Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Return, backsliding children, says the Lord. I am married to you. In the New Testament, God also uses a, um, a marriage as an illustration to communicate the relationship with us and Christ and with the church. And I would ask you guys to read this together. So if we read the verse together, we're going to be reading a lot of verses together. If we read it, I want us to be united and, and you know, read it as slow as you can, as clear as you can. All right, so I ask you guys to read Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 15. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast for the Yes, more as long as the bride brings you to them, it is for 
So, Jesus uses this illustration of marriage when he said, I am the groom and the church is the bride. And so one day I'm going to be taken away. Then when I'm away, the church will pass. They will pray and they will seek me. Again, another one. In Matthew chapter 25, the whole parable of ten virgins is the parable of Christ coming again to his bride. Again, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 to 32. I asked you guys to read this as well. Another one is Revelation chapter 9. Sorry, chapter 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, the church, has made herself ready. So this is, um, we see here from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's an illustration of God. Um, he uses the, 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 mar the marriage, right? So to be an illustration for us to, to, to see. Um, so now let's look at the um, specific example of Hosea showcasing his relationship with Gomer reflect Jesus' relationship with his bride, the church. Right? So number one, Hosea took to himself a bride who was altogether unworthy of him and totally without regard for him. In the same way, Jesus Christ did the same thing. Christ took to himself a bride who was altogether unworthy of him and totally without regard for him. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we have reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and throughout both the old, sorry, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Number two. Hosea pledged his faithfulness to his bride, Gomer, not because he knew that she would be faithful, but knowing that she would not be faithful. Same way Jesus did the same thing. Jesus pledged his faithfulness to his bride, the church, because this is the very nature of him. Even though we are unfaithful, he is always faithful. Right? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, he remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Number three. Gomer's pursuits of other lovers brought her into bondage, slavery, and utter ruin. The church, pursuits of other lovers brought her into bondage, slavery, and utter ruin. John chapter 8, verse 4. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And Romans chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. I ask you guys to read this with me. Number 
before. Hosea redeemed Gomer by paying the ransom price of silver and barley. Same thing. Jesus redeemed his church, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ without blemish or spot. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, now with per perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you. Number five, Hosea redeemed Gomer, sanctifying her to himself. Jesus redeemed his church, sanctifying her completely to himself. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses 23 to 24. You guys read it. Number six, Hosea loved his bride Gomer, who was not pure with the intention of making her pure. So Jesus loved his bride, the church, who was not pure with the intention of making her pure and without spot or blemish. Again, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Husband, love your wives, a church, sorry, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that she might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water in the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Last one. Out of great love for Gomer, Hosea brought her home to live with him where he could show kindness to her over the years to come. Same thing Jesus did out of great love for the church, Jesus brought her home to live with him where he could show kindness to her over the years to come. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. You guys read it. So, how can one pastor say that we can dis disregard the Old Testament? If you can see the illustration and you can see that what exactly Hosea did, exactly what Jesus did. He's a pointer to our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So, to summarize, God commands one of his holy prophet, prophets to, to marry, and not just to marry anyone, but a prostitute. God called Hosea to do his very unusual and hard thing in order to illustrate God's relationship with the Jewish people. And if you read the book in the Old Testament over and over again, we see somewhat of a broken one-sided relationship. Gomer is, a pictured, is pictured as the Israel, God's chosen people. They will continue this cycle of repentance, redemption, and restoration. God was their husband. And they were committing adultery with the worship of idols 
Idolatry is a spiritual form of prostitution. In our relationship with Christ, we must be faithful. This is us now. We must keep him the center of everything that we do. God wanted a to have a relationship with his people. He wanted to bless the Israelites and give them a life full of joy. But sin took them to a place where God said to them, repent or you face my wrath. Sin can also take us to the same place today. But we have the promise that the restoration is possible, right? The beautiful part of Gomer's story here is that she affirmed that no one is beyond forgiveness and restoration. Let me repeat that. The beautiful part of Gomer's story is that she affirms that no one is beyond forgiveness and restoration. Hosea buys back his wife. Again, if you read the whole chapter, right? Hosea buys back his wife. Although his wife is, you know, wanted to be with other men, sleeping around with other men, he buys her back with silver and barley. Isn't it the same thing what Christ has done for us as well? He buys, he bought us back. Jesus did the same thing. He bought us back with his own blood and he died for us and he saved us. He forgave us. He sanctified us, adopted us, redeemed us, and cleansed us. God sent his son to save each of us. No matter how bad we, we, we think we have acted or what sins we have committed, we can still receive the gift, the gift of salvation. To those of you who have lost your faith or wondering why you are here today, there's a reason why you're here today. Christ wants you. No, we're not going to pray the prayer of acceptance. But if you are wondering and curious who is Jesus, come talk to me, talk to our pastor. Okay, so this is the good news of Christmas. Time and time again, we must reflect to this during this season. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, came to that first Christmas to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament and a long-awaited Messiah, a savior for all mankind. So today, let's give him the honor and the praise that he's due today as we remember his birthday, as we eagerly await for his second coming. Before I end, I'd like us all to, to sing happy birthday to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? How are we going to do this? Right? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday, Jesus. Let's pray.